what it costs. Yeah, I hit the ground and it go off. Yeah, hit the ground and it go off. Yeah, yeah, run it, run it. Ooh, I really feel it's my time. Think it's my year. Yeah. All right, did I hit the button? Yes, I think I did. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the morning show here on Stock Market TV. Spencer, Steve, JC, Alfonso with you on this fine, fine Monday morning. Uh, synthetic did Tuesday. I hit the button? Yes, synthetic I think Tuesday. I did. Good morning, everybody. Welcome because we to have uh, no market, no show on Friday. So if you didn't know that, now you do. All right, here's what's going on today. We got David Settle on the show today. He'll be on at 9 uh, we'll have, uh, as we do every Monday, Mr. Ian Cully on to talk some fixed stuff on later on at around 9.30. I know JC wants to talk about the dollar. Uh, Steve probably wants to talk about some short squeeze stocks. Maybe I want to talk about uh, Boeing and Lucid and DWAC. So we, and whatever you want to talk about, drop it in the chat. I want to know. All right, let's go get the show on the road. Let's bring the guys on and talk some stocks. Oh, wait, did I not bring them on? What's going on here? What's going on here? Where am I? Hey, guys? here we are. Here we are. All right. Let me just tell you guys minor league hockey, dude. Yeah. Love it. I, about this. Love it. I was going to ask you. Dude, I can't get enough of it. Minor league hockey, man. So fun. Especially like with kids, you know? So you got a team right there in what is it, Lehigh? The Lehigh Valley Phantoms. Let's yeah. go. So, you and know, it's like, it's like what? What um, professional team? Uh, they are. This is the tenth year in their existence. They are part of the Flyers. Oh, cool! And they played the Penguins yesterday, or the equivalent uh, team. Yeah. Nice. Cool. Dude, they got mascots, music. Also, it's like minor league baseball, but hockey. You know. Yeah. And you probably get good seats too. There's no bad seat in the house. A small arena. It's a great place to see a concert. It's a great place for Disney on ice and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. You ever go watch the uh, Sound Tigers when you were at Fairfield? Mm, they were the the ones in Bridgeport? Yeah. I think they were called something else. Really? I think they were called something else. But yeah, I played there, actually. We played, That was a nice, nice little stadium. Yeah, you, what's that big game Fairfield U has every year? Isn't it like the rivalry game that you guys play at that stadium? Nah, I think we play like Niagara or something. Okay. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, man, Bridgeport, Connecticut, lovely this time of year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Speaking of the stags, ladies got knocked out this weekend. You see that? I did not. Girls. Yeah. I'm, I'm not from Connecticut. I don't watch women's basketball. You know what you guys should both do? The rest of, nobody, like the rest of the country does not care. Like, I know you're from Connecticut. Like, I get it. But the rest yeah, of us don't care. A lot of people from Connecticut don't care either but we, we want a double this year we're really looking for a double so we need the ladies to pull their weight um you guys should go to a new york rangers hockey game i love rangers hockey games yeah but i I, I don't have enough money in my net worth to afford rangers tickets are they expensive i don't think i've actually ever they're paid crazy tickets. they're crazy I've, really it's 500 or up for a playoff stop really they're crazy oh. I've always, I just I used to get invited all the time to Rangers Bruins Rangers Devils it was awesome but like I never actually like volunteered and be like oh I want to go to the hockey game today but it was great you know um all right so uh let's go why don't we we got a lot to talk about let's do what we? you hit this Spencer? I, we? all right I think we a lot there might not be a better name though than the Savannah bananas so good so good <laughs> did you see roger clemens pitch for the savannah bananas the other day oh. Oh. 61 years old roger clemens coming in there pitching <laughs> for the savannah bananas so good dude he's still on juice probably probably um Leftover jc juice. the bananas are coming i think to philadelphia stop i'll go see the bananas <laughs> yeah we looked into it briefly um yeah i think in a few months dude i'm totally i'm totally doing it so i've had like um I've had Lil John and DJ Snake in my head all morning. Um, 
you know, because I'm watching the U.S. dollar going up every day and, yeah. and, and the indexes and, and a lot of stocks continue to go up. So turn down for what? You know? I thought you were gonna, like, I thought you were gonna say you watch the US dollar go up and you're just thinking like, okay. Uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> um, yeah, you know, like you know that song turned down for what? Mm -hmm. EJ Snake and and a, and a one Lil John, the Atlanta born uh poet and musician. Um turned down for what? You know, dollar can keep going up and stocks don't care. Speaking of the Dirty South rap, I've been really enjoying the ludicrous um, inspired commercials. Hold on, this is not this is this is not about rap. I'm very curious. I'm very yeah, curious to hear your thoughts. Um, Burn yeah. down for what? Is it going to matter for risk assets? Though is the bigger question, right? That's because my question here, right? So, if we know that the U.S. dollar has been the only safe haven, right, and certainly not U.S. Treasury bonds or gold or Bitcoin or any of these other things. And the dollar is it just went out highest weekly close since early November. Mm -hmm. Dollar bottomed late December. Uh so you know it's it's one of those things where do if the dollar continues gonna go up, is that bad for risk assets? Uh do risk assets no longer care? Are we so far along in this bull market that correlations have come off so much uh that they can just continue to move in the same direction? What do you think? I think it's a primary trend thing. Right, we've been looking at the dollar and interest rates for a year and a half now, uh, and they've been range bound, both of them. I think this four and a quarter level for the ten year is just it, it, the market's telling us again how important this level is. And the dollar, if you look at it, you could draw a big rectangle here on this chart. Right, this is a range. Maybe the market needs to see these ranges resolve, right, because that will. That will indicate to them maybe more higher dollars in the future or further lower dollar in the future. Then maybe you get more of a reaction from risk assets because for now it's like the dollar ticks higher and risk assets are completely unaffected, but it's ticking higher within a range. I think you need a yeah, no. That's a good. That's a good point, right? So this downtrend line. That's you know we're not we're not huge into diagonal trend lines for for good reason. Uh, the market doesn't really care as much about the diagonal trend lines as it does the horizontal ones. I'm much more interested in the horizontal ones. So Strauss is making a great point. Uh, this falls within the context of a range-bound market for the dollar, um, which is not a bad thing for stocks. Even even prior to this year, we would have said the same thing, right? Yeah. Same thing with yields, right? You can argue ten-year yields. Yields are technically worse. it's technically they've been going up all year, but technically they're kind of in a range, kind of like the dollar, right? I think this four and a quarter and tens is is huge. Um, let's but see. Even I, I agree, four and a quarter is huge. But it's still messy. So whether we're above yeah. four and a quarter, we're we're below four and a quarter on the U.S. ten-year yield, still in a range. To your earlier point, you know, if you take out four and a quarter and tens, uh, high likelihood you're testing five, right? And if you and if you break five, you're at new decade long highs. Um, I mean, we're basically at four and a quarter now, right? Yeah. So I mean, why why wouldn't you say you need like a more like a four three five? No, because I, we have price memory around this four and a quarter. It's a range. It's like fine, four, but in the short term, it's more of a four, three, five, four, four. Like my those are my old forty times, you know. Four, are three, you saying five, four thirty? Yeah, four thirty up to like four, four thirty three. Yeah, yeah four thirty five. Uh, you got to take out the twenty, the twenty four highs. Twenty four highs gets taken out in the ten year yield. Bonds are falling apart. That probably becomes a problem for the market. That's how I see that. The pivot highs, not the yeah. 2023 highs. No, no, no. The recent highs this year, this year's yeah. highs. And then the 2022 high continues to be that that's you got a nice polarity line there. Right? Yeah. Okay. That was a, that was a strong close there for the dollar index though last week, though. Well, that was aggressive. What, is, what will it take for JC to buy some bonds? What will it take for JC to buy bonds? The time to buy bonds was last October, first of all. Um, like treasury bonds, like a TLT, or like something more short duration? I mean, emerging market high yield bonds, uh, nice reversal. You can buy them. I mean, I just don't, I, I buying bonds here is like buying regional banks. Like, it's just kind of like this like range bound mess of a messy mess, you know? 
do we or like buy or like buying like the Russell 2000 or something like that? Like, it's just mass. Like, why would I do that to myself? When we look at the, yeah, I understand. Uh, when we look at the EM HY emerging market high yields and see that reversal pattern, uh, resolving higher, is that a read on emerging market stocks where you would say, why wouldn't they look the same or no? We're having the chart. Here. I think it depends on the cycle. I, I would argue this particular cycle, uh, I don't think you're too far off. I think there's something there. I don't think that's always the case, though. Right? If high-yield bonds are doing well, is that good for emerging market stocks right now? Yeah, probably. No? I agree. It's not bad, right? No, it's not a bad thing. Oh, not bad. No. You know, for me, I'm more interested, like, in the currency markets, but if high-yield bonds are doing well, you know then the emerging market currencies are probably doing well in this market, right? That's not always the case either, but in this case it is. Just flipping through some of my charts. Of um, let's get into, uh, let's get into the short interest. I want to hear, I want to hear your thoughts here. I mean, that's my thoughts on the dollar turned out for what I, I'm very curious to hear um, your thoughts on the short squeeze stuff, because I find this uh, list of names with very high short ratios. In other words, the days to cover. So you take all the shares outstanding out there, uh, take all the shares that are short, look at the average daily volume and figure out in a, in a normal day, how many days will it take for all the shorts to cover, right? Mm -hmm. um, I calculated the other day that all of uh, Berkshire Hathaway's Apple position can be liquidated in one day uh, based on the total volume, the average volume. I thought that was interesting. It has nothing to do with this, but I did, did some math. If there's a lot of... If, if a stock is heavily traded, you know, and you see this with the Bitcoin miners, it could have like a 20% short interest, but if all the shorts matter. cover in a single day, I, I don't know how squeezy it really is. Sure. Can, can you get a squeeze? Yes. Is it going to be as aggressive of a move as you get from something that maybe takes 10 days to cover because it barely trades? No, not, not at all. So I think you got to pay attention to both. I don't think one is better than the other. Just look at the market caps. This that gives you that this is exactly what you're talking about. Look at the market caps on this list. These are the ones with the highest short ratios. Notice how there aren't any trillion dollar companies on this list. This one is actually neither. It's the short interest is above 15. Uh days to cover we didn't scan for. And then it's actually sorted by momentum because that's the third part of it, right? We could talk about there's a lot of shorts, there's a lot of investors betting against this. That's fine. It could it could steadily um, you know, drop to zero with with a high short interest, it needs some short term momentum to come into the name to fuel some short covering, which will then fuel a short covering rally. Right. So without any momentum, you don't want to touch any of these names. Right. Like that's big caveat. Because it feeds on it feeds on itself. Right. So as momentum starts to come in, those are buyers stepping in. Those are shorts covering, which brings in more buyers. That's us. That's where we come in and more brings in more cover and it just keeps feeding on itself and it's just like this revolving cycle it could even be a day or two right like we we talk sometimes maybe we should sort it by one week that's why we got the one week there too you know you really want to watch both but as soon as momentum starts to come in then that's when you get the up 10 percent, up 20 percent in the day type moves from these names they could all do it um but they're not going to do it without that short-term momentum uh i wasn't going to go into individual names uh why not save that well, why don't you walk through? Why don't you walk through the the thought process of one? Uh, I mean, you can even do the uh, Carvana. I was gonna say, do the poster child. So Carvana, we call the poster child at least of the the last I would say two cycles. This has been in the top five, ten every time we run this scan. Right? It's just one of the most hated stocks on Wall Street. Uh, it's a true battleground stock too. We've watched this stock go from like four or five hundred back to four or five. And now maybe back to four or 500 again, right? Um, yeah, we can throw up the bubble chart too. So you got the base breakout here. The level for that is like 60, 70. And then just high and tight above the base breakout level, right? Just flagging, following a textbook trend reversal. So we think you can buy the resolution of this coil and bet on another leg higher. It's really, it's really that simple. I would much rather buy the resolution of this flag than buy weakness back towards the base breakout level. Do you agree? Because if you're buying weakness back towards the base breakout level, you don't know how long you're hanging out there. You're risking a fail. You're risking a failed breakout. Right. You want to buy momentum. Yeah, that's probably right. 
and you want to and, and I would say I would say probably always, but in this case, way more so, even more so, right? Carvana's a wild child. And the the standard time frame for these trades really is a couple days to a couple weeks. We put the time frame one to three months for most of these, but they should hit targets a lot faster. Um, so if you get something that's a runner 50, 60, 70% in a couple days, and we got a price target that's 10 points higher, don't be afraid to pay yourself in these names. These are Dawson. Dawson's talking about how the Y axis on this one is wild. I just said things that. up like 2,500% off the lows, 2,500%. And the short interest is still off the charts. What is it? Like a third of the float still short? Uh, throw up the short interest table. It's a lot. It's a lot. Doesn't matter what it is. It's a lot. Throw up the bubble too. Under the yeah, bubble. Throw, the, throw up the bubble and then we'll do a quick little market rundown. We didn't include the bubble in the post. I didn't want to mess with the flow. So we got so the walk, one walk, walk us through what's happening here. We got the one month change on the X, right? Because you want them to start moving. Anything on, on the left hand side of the screen, you really don't want um, because there's none of that short term momentum. All of the names in this bubble have a hefty short interest. Uh, the lowest short interest on here is probably around 16%. And you can see something like Atmos Energy, ATMU, up near 70, 80% almost. Look what that stock did last week, right? Once that momentum comes in, they really start going. Carvana, same thing. Uh, Novavax, Dreamfinders, Homes, I like a lot. DFH, Rocket, also my loan provider, RKT. Love here's that. My, here's my question. Here's here's what I don't like about this chart. JC loves seeing Transocean on here because it's such a blast from the past. It is. Um, GameStop. Uh, so, so hold on. Here's my beef with this chart. You got beef? Love a bubble chart. I think the world needs more. The world needs more bubble charts. You got to give the people what they want, Strasso. So, so that that's that's one one for the good guys there. Yeah. What I don't like here is I don't think it's necessary for the size of the bubble to be the days to cover, and then the y-axis is the short interest. Why? Why? Why do I even care about the short interest? The short interest is very important. Why wouldn't the y-axis just be the days to cover, and the size of the bubble be uh, RSI? We made it that way for you. Right. I think that's just a way smarter way to do this. No? Uh, RSI tells me nothing in this. But why are you instead. double dipping on days to cover and short interest? Doesn't days to cover just supersede short interest? Not really. Because, all right, say the days to cover is 10. You love it. Two stocks. Both have days to cover of 10. One wow. of them's got a 30 or 40% short interest. The other one's 15% short interest. You want the one that's 40. Do you? I think so. Sure. You think it matters that much? It, are the days it, it probably more? matters more at the extremes, right? So at a certain point, does it matter? Like at a certain baseline? No, it doesn't matter as long as you're above a certain threshold or right? whatever. Right. Threshold. And, and Straza says that all the time. Like we don't care whether it's 18% or 19% or 11 days to cover. No, or no, no. Eight, you don't care if it's 18 or it's 19, but you probably care if it's 18 or if it's 50. I get, I get JC's point because what he's saying is days to cover is incorporating short interest. It's just, it's just a better measure. Um, yeah. It gets right to the point. Yeah, but what if... Yeah, How see, many damn days is it going to take for these idiots to cover? If you're following along at home... Usually, the, usually they're idiots. JC's not, always, not sometimes wrong. They're right. and, and it would work here simply because we have a floor. Nothing below a 15% short interest is included in this universe. So then you know that you already have the short interest that you want, baseline, 15%. It's like the, uh, it's like the then, hot crazy matrix for short interest, right? So it's a, at least a 15, right? Look at how some of these stocks move once they start moving. Yeah. Look at ATMU. Uh, but that's why I'm interested in the, I'm more interested in the RSI than I am in having, ha, yeah, now we're talking. But I would, I would honestly prefer, uh, I would prefer the size of the bubble probably to be RSI. The Y axis uh, could be the days to cover. I was just going to say, put days See, to cover. This one doesn't even have days to cover. Like, I hate to be like a stickler, like such a ball buster, but like, you know. Yeah, maybe. Just saying. Those are, those are my two cents. Chat, I mean, feel that way in. Anybody thoughts? The size yeah. of the bubble could be lots of things. Yeah. So, no, but I really like RSI because RSI will give us what type of momentum regime we're in, which I really like the one month rate of change for all the things that Strazza said. So, notice how I haven't mentioned that at all. I'm totally with you on that. Because you want short-term momentum, but I'm interested in the bigger picture momentum story. Did you see the AI generated image of a short squeeze that I sent you? I did. I don't think that's safe for work. No, it's not. But it's that's why I texted it. That's why'd you do that? Which platform? Sam did that. I didn't even do it. 
Oh, you you don't know how to do that. No. Um, all right, let's do a quick little rundown. Uh, Dow futures, Dow futures this morning do down seventy points, uh, seventy five points on the Dow futures. S and P futures down a third of a percent. Nasdaq futures down half a percent. You've got bond futures pretty much flat on the thirty year. You've got gold up almost one percent. Silver up about a third of a percent. Copper flat on the day. Crude oil up a third of a percent. Uh, and the dollar slightly down this morning with euro and yen uh, slightly higher. You've got the volatility index around 13 and a half for the VIX. U.S. 10-year yield uh, hanging around that key four and a quarter level that we continue to point out. And, of course, in the old funny money, we're looking at Bitcoin. We're looking at Bitcoin prices at 67000 Hanging in there very impressively, Strez, I must say, uh, absorbing this overhead supply. Um, I would argue very impressive. Uh, Ethereum. Uh, right around 34.50 uh, flat on the day. Of course, Solana, uh, 187 also continues to be very, very impressive there. Uh, hanging around 187. Total crypto market cap, Spencer Israel, 2.47 trillion American dollars. Can you do pot stocks for Spencer now? Are they we don't anything? have to. I was just no. observing. Well, you want to add the, the pot that. stock index to our morning rundown? Well, pot stocks went up for a day. So a week, a week, a week. week. It went up for a week, so that means they have wow. to go down four consecutive weeks now. This is also true. This is this is the law of the laws of the universe. I don't make the rules. When you say, hold on, when you say pot stocks have been went up last week, do you mean like an MSOS? Yeah, all of the above. You know how it's like it was like yeah, MJ, uh, cool. wow. you know how it was like cool to smoke pot when you're in middle school. It's like it's like cool to buy pot stocks for for like traders. I feel like it's the same it's the same vibe and attitude. I don't understand it. What's I don't. Cool I don't agree with that at all. Like I don't. I don't. I don't agree why, with that. Then why do people still talk about them obsessively? When because they they're high beta, high beta AF, high beta to the downside. Fine, but high beta nevertheless. High I beta mean, goes are, both ways. By the way, these are the worst <laughs> stocks in the entire stock market and have been for like multiple cycles now, and people are still obsessed with them. There's a psychological thing going on here. I don't know what it is, but there's yeah. something. Like, are you saying Spencer that. Israel has mental problems? No, I think it's like it's like cool to like pot stocks. There's nothing else to explain this. It, no, it's just cool to say that you made money on a on a marijuana right. stock, right? Is like it? That's that's for you. I don't it's wouldn't novel. say cool. I would it's, say unique. Like you tell people you made money on marijuana, like really? How'd you do yeah, that? Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> it's more. Sorry, like cannabis. Intrigue. Sorry, Bill. Cannabis. It's like, cannabis. It's like saying saying you made money like being long yen or something. What's the difference between cannabis and pot, dude? What? Who cares? What's the difference? <laughs> No, there is no pot. difference. I need pot is the slang. Cannabis I mean, how is the, flower. the difference is your age, right? No, but cannabis is the flower. Pot is just like what you say you smoke. Yeah. Like, I don't like seriously, this is a real question. I don't, I don't know. know. They call Wait. it flower now at the dispensaries. Before uh, we move on. Cannabis from is the a short great squeeze, rapper. Great American rapper. I, 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 before we move on, I dropped the link to the short squeeze post in the chat. If you want to look at that more in depth, that's yeah. where you would find it. Check it right. out there. And we're going to do more of them. Thank you, Spencer. I just want yep. to address one question here because it's a good question. Uh, Vintage says, I get that, but how come Riley is not on your list? Because we control the list and we removed it because we think Riley's a real dog. But throw up the uh, slide one because it is on the list. On the list. It has a short interest. We are completely uninterested in this one, so we stripped it out. But, yeah, you're right, 82%. There's people going to jail on this one, huh? Seems that way. Seems that way. So this is one we're just, this is a fraud case right now. So uh, we're staying away from it. it. We left Silvergate on our list two years ago and we're just trying to avoid making the same mistake. I don't, I don't think that there's a, I don't think we want to avoid having these names on the list. We could decide do. we don't want you to You just want it. to remove exogenous stocks. I was long Silvergate when it went to zero. So, the common or the options? I was long calls, but still. Right, so you have uh, risk management already built into your strategy. Yeah, well, I don't want that again. So anyone that has a risk of zero, like like a... For the record, they all have a risk of zero. There's a reason why they're so heavily shorted, Straza. Dude, fine. But there are some that have like a much more obvious and looming risk of zero. This is like, they're going to get an SEC notice any day kind of risk of zero. And I don't want to be there for a down 40%, down 60% day. I think, you're overthinking. I think you're overthinking. You, you, you just want to remove exogenous risk. And that's what uh, Riley has risk that is totally disassociated from its yeah. short squeeze metrics, right? It, it, there's other stuff going on. There's other names on here that, 
maybe aren't quality, but are not in Fraud, the- are not frauds, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so no, I I don't. I think that's a prudent move to remove those, yep. and that's what we do. Yeah. All right. Go go on. Keep talking about your flowers. No, I don't know if there's much more to say about that. Yeah, there's nothing um, to say. They suck. The Canadian uh, are ones buying, are worse than the American ones. Is that the story? Are you buying Tilray here? Tilray's on our short squeeze list. We did not outline a trade on this one. Should we have? Oh, I didn't even. Uh, thank you, Miglani, in the chat. I didn't. This this is Friday after the close. What? Riley files delinquency notice with Nasdaq. Yeah, because they can't file their yeah. uh, their annual or their. All right. Yeah, There's no what because Straza. What is it? No auditor will sign off on it. That's the story. Yeah. No. Yeah, they can't file. So if you can't file, you can't be listed. Because if the auditor signs off on it, then they get in trouble. Yeah, hell yeah. Yeah, the guy's like, I'm not going to jail for you idiots. No, oh, they're right? out the door. Yeah. Uh, they're just, this is just a waiting game now, like how bad is it going to be situation. But not hearing yeah. things. I would love to get Mark Cahodes on the show. I know I keep saying it. I, I shot him a DM. I didn't get a response yet. I'll try again. I'll try to. Keep trying. I think Pat might know. Pat knows everybody. I don't know, That's the mayor. Prudent is a CPA term? Maybe. Who's doing, who's doing their taxes this weekend? Done. 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 Look at you. Look at me go. Dude, seriously? How do you not file an extension? Come on. Who does their taxes in April, bro? I wouldn't be able to. I wouldn't be able to. Dude. Binance. I didn't even, I didn't even ask my accountant. My accountant messaged me. He's like, hey, by the way, don't worry about it. We already got that extension. I'm like... I wasn't worried, but thanks, <laughs> man. Yeah, extensions all day. Is there any reason why I wouldn't get approved? Because you know how you have to like apply for an extension. Is there any I, reason? I why have you never heard of. No, no, no you never can heard extend, of that. You go on an extension even if you didn't file last year's. So anybody can go on an extension. Well, yep. Apparently, I am anybody because I. It's that's what I. Model. That's how I roll. That's you know. And and the reason why JC can't file his and he's laughing and a lot of people can file on time and sh- and should. Um, is because he's a K one guy and he doesn't have the information that he needs to file right now. And that's is that case. why? I thought it was just because I, I I get to delay it six months and it gives me more time. No, it doesn't I, give me more time. You still have to pay. No, no, I know, but I have more time to kind of go over stuff. Oh, more time to get your ass organized. You mean? Yeah, yeah, maybe. But I'm sure you have K ones that are still dripping in slowly, uh, not on time. That's, I just forward them over. I don't even know. I don't even know. The less I know, the better. Do they go straight to your accountant? Uh, some do, some do. Okay, he's a man. Yeah. All right. Should we? Why don't we bring on uh, today's featured guest, Mister Mister David Settle, co-founder of Market Scholars. He's here. He sent us a couple charts. Dropped him in the deck. Let's see what's on his mind. Jay, we've make, been friends for a long time. Make the call. I mean, this is pretty professional, guys. It's a nice, uh, nice show you got going here. Oh. David, what's going on, man? <laughs> Not much. Right and early over here on the West Coast, or at least in the West. Where, where are you? You in uh, Utah? Utah, yep. Are you yep. a BYU guy? Um, For most of the year. Uh, <laughs> just for some odd reason in March, they decide that they don't, uh, they don't like to play anymore. Yeah, sorry about that. That was, that was, a, uh, that was a tough one. <laughs> was a tough one that's but but it's getting normal it's like i'm i'm getting used to it now it's getting normal uh, at least i'm not a kentucky fan <laughs> silver lining that's right <laughs> that's right a lot of disappointment there um yeah. all right david listen i uh i appreciate you coming on this morning um you know you uh you you are formally trained in a very similar way to a lot of us but sure. you know like many uh technicians and practitioners around the world you bring your own unique twist uh to this sure. market you know your own uh unique lens and your experiences and everything like that before we get into the current market do you want to kind of just want to uh explain to the audience a little bit about your experience and through what lens you viewed the marketplace yeah, so te- technical analysis is kind of what I was uh, trained up in. I, that's where I started my career and and uh, just looking at charts and looking at patterns and and trying to understand um, the psychology of the markets behind what the price behavior is telling us. That I think that's kind of a big deal of what price 
Christ tells us what the human psychology is, is going on right now. And you, you kind of see that in, in, in the stock markets, right? With, with how they, I mean, I, I caught your, I caught your uh, beginning of your discussion here about the dollar and, and this year to date move on the dollar and um, not, you know, not just the dollar yields, you know, up as well and commodities up as well. And, and yet, and yet the stock market is, you know, like in some ways on, on an unprecedented uh, rally right now, covering really from last Halloween up through the beginning of this first few months of this year. So it's, it is interesting to see the behavior uh, of the market uh, continuing on this, on this trend, despite the fact that you have moves going on in other asset classes, uh, which is also a big part of my training, this inner market. Uh, intermarket relationships that drive things. Uh, you have these other other asset classes that that recently has put a lot of pressure on risk appetite just in general. But risk appetite right now is so strong. I mean, you could even be you could even you know be in pot stocks right now, and and things will you know things will overcome. Well, for, for a week, David, for a week. So, so <laughs> for a week. But, you know, there's there 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 is a lot of risk appetite right now, and it's and it's definitely overcoming anything that that has generally derailed it uh, in the past. I'm glad you brought this up. You know, you're you're talking about things like uh, energy and the dollar moving together. You know, the dollar and rates moving together. Um, you're looking at um, correlations. You these days that are just not what you and I have been used to for a long, Even long gold. time. And, gold right? and the dollar are moving That's up right. this year. Commodities and the dollar, really, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, what are your thoughts there? Um, do you believe that we're just in a different, uh, you know, inflationary regime, you know, as they say, more of a uh, more of an inflationary regime, which is why these relationships have changed yeah, uh, versus yeah. the deflationary regime that we've been in for the majority of our careers? For the longest time, on me there. But for the longest time, the uh, you know you read these books back at, back when I was first starting, they were books. Now you just read everything online. But you read these books about intermarket relationships, and you always read about you know this is what happens in an inflationary environment. This is what happens in an inflationary environment. But for years, we've never had an inflationary environment. So it's like when does that when does that relationship ever happen? When do stocks and bonds actually go up together? Right, because it's generally been you know stocks going up for years and years and years, and bonds were coming down for years and years and years. And then all of a sudden, twenty twenty two happens, and it's like, oh, they they actually do go, you know, move together uh, at at some time. So there actually are inflationary periods, and and so that's it. Seems like we're going through that, and it's it is throwing off a lot of, you know, these these relationships that we've experienced for what twenty some odd years. You know, and I see it out there, right? As you said, you know, uh, these books, uh, you know, these days we, we read a lot online. Um, you know, we see a lot of opinions and everything like that. And I think we continue to see a lot of investors out there uh, failing to adapt to uh, the new environment and these new relationships. And they keep right. trying to press old things that used to work and are just waiting for you know, waiting for the cycle to come back instead of just adapting your strategy to the way the cycle currently is. And, and those people are losing really hard and you can really sense their frustrations. Right. And that's the thing about intermarket analysis is, you know, you, when you talk to people about it and there's always like, well, you know, when, when the dollar goes up, gold goes down, when the dollar, you know, and vice versa and, and, and all the other very traditional relationships. And it's like, well, I mean, if you, if you look at a correlation chart, uh, it, it is very cyclical. Even, I mean, even when they are positive, they're not always like 90% positive or 75% or more positive. There might be some periods like right now, gold and the dollar are negative, but the relationship, like if you look at a 30, a, a three month relationship of gold and the dollar, it's still negative, but it's like barely negative. Whereas, you know, normally it, it's like 90 some odd percent negative. Yeah. So, so, so even though that relationship is still what you think it would be, uh, there is some cyclicality to it. And so, you know, so during while it's on this kind of mode where it doesn't behave like normal, you, you can't necessarily base trading decisions based off of what we what we've read. Right. What we what, you know, the dollars going up. So, OK, let's short gold. No, gold is uh, doing pretty well right now. It's on a pretty good trend itself. You know, let's wait until it breaks that trend before we do anything negative on gold or any of the miners or any stocks associated with it.
So I think the bigger theme here is that it's not one relationship that has changed. It's a lot of different relationships that have changed, which is what makes me believe that we're, you know, has made me believe that we're just in a different type of regime, right? It's not like just one thing. It's a lot of things. Right, right. Yeah, and it's that inflationary. It's that, I mean, we, I mean, even with, even with those year over year inflation rates down from where they had peaked, um, you know, that they're still at current levels as high as they had been for decades, right? So, I mean, it's still a pretty high level of year over year, you know, CPI, PCE, core, whatever you want to look at. They're all still pretty darn high level. So this is just a different environment than say, uh, like the 2000 and um, post 2008, like in the teens, when, when there's a bunch of QE flooding in the system. And we thought, well, I, I think a lot of people thought, well, this is what's going to happen. Like the, the, the Fed is flooding QE3 into the system. So there's going to be a lot of inflation. But there was never any, uh, there was never any inflation, right? Inflation rates were still very, very low for year, you know, for years. I mean, they raised rates once in 15 and raised rates again once and a year later in 2016 because there was no velocity of money. There was no exchanging um, that money. And it was just a bunch of money sitting on a bunch of balance sheets doing nothing, providing liquidity for the most part. But in 2021, all that QE and, and for really all that fiscal money that came into the system started exchanging hands and velocity explodes. And we have inflation that we have just haven't had to the degree we haven't had for 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 a lot of us. Ever. Never in my career. Yeah. We've never had this amount of inflation in my career uh, from when I started. A, this is a great point, David. I don't think enough people are talking about this. How much are you thinking about where interest rates go from here? I mean, do you think that there's a chance we get another hike before we start cutting? Um, I don't. I, I think that would be uh, very untenable <laughs> politically if we if we got a rate hike just out of the out of the blue. I think the in I an election they, year. What's that? In an election year, too. Yeah, yeah. I think, and they've been they've been setting up the market for cuts. So I mean, and this Fed does not like to throw anything out. Uh, they they like to set things up and and yeah. um so they've been set I mean so I don't think I think it's kind of like 2015 they hiked just the hike they didn't really have to hike they hiked just the hike and then they waited another year before the next one I think you're going to get a cut just to get a cut just to say that they did it and just right. to provide some you know some liquidity but they don't they don't really like have to I mean so it's like you're saying like it's going to be like a credibility cut like right, they're going to cut right because they've been talking about it for so long, but then you might get a, a little break in between of just yeah. nothing. Yeah, yeah. And and I wouldn't be surprised if I wouldn't be surprised if it's not in June. Like I my thing, my basis, my bull narrative for all of last year and even this year is the best case scenario for the markets to continue to trend higher is to keep that inverted yield, keep that yield curve inverted. Yep. And and keep the prospect of rate cuts on the table, but never actually use them. Right. right. Never actually cut. Uh, and if you do just cut once, because because, you know, if we start cutting regularly, generally, that's not necessarily the best thing for the for markets. So no. if we can just get one and then put it off, but like, keep them on the table. I think as we've seen for eight for what, 15 months now, the market loves that. Absolutely loves that. Yeah, you're right. And it sure feels like we're in a sweet spot. Like like you talk about the inflation numbers are coming a little bit hot, but it's not the end of the world. Probably a good thing. And employment's yeah. just fine. So why mess with it right now? Why yeah. do anything if you don't have to? Keep that yield curve inverted and uh, inverted as long as possible. The, explain, the longer it's inverted, the better. Ex explain why you say that. So we're still underwater, below zero, been dancing around there for a while. It's kind of done nothing, ten, two yeah. tens. What happens when it uninverts historically? That, that is traditionally when the markets uh, start to, to uh, falter, right? That's when they start to correct. And and if not correct into bear market mode. And, you know, there obviously hasn't been very many times that they've been uh, inverted, uh, especially to this extent. Um, but every time that has been inverted, usually the Fed doesn't start cutting until it has uninverted the two, the 10 year, two year specifically. It hasn't yeah. they haven't started to cut until it has already uninverted. Um, and then once it has, then then that's they don't stop. And, and I think the recency bias of that mid cycle adjustment in 2019, where they cut just a few times in the summer and the market just kind of took off. I think that's kind of the reason why we have, you know, we were talking earlier, like we know 
the recency thing of like, oh, this is how it always is. Like, well, yeah. you know, in 2019, the Fed cut rates a few times and the market just rallied up to that COVID, that pre-COVID peak, which was a pretty darn high peak. Um, and that's, you know, that's what the market's going to do this time. Well, that's not, that's not traditionally, you know, the, the stock market reaction to a rate cut cycle. Um, because, you know, when the, when the yield curve uninverts, that's not, we don't want that. We want it to stay inverted as, as long. I mean, again, 15 months and we've been doing just fine with it. Hold on. But David, if we're talking about just like a new regime and a lot of things being different. All those things that you're talking about in the past, are, are, are they still valid despite the change in regime? Hard to say. I, I would, th I mean, I would think so. I mean, the, the, the difference, one of the big differences is that we generally don't get a yield curve this inverted, right? When was the last time it's, when was the last time the 10 year, three month has been, in which the three month I use kind of as a proxy for the Fed funds, right? The, the, the effective Fed funds rate, like how long, how, how long, how often have we been this inverted, like well over a hundred basis points? For this long, so that's probably why, like the early, like the early '80s, I think. Yeah, yeah, way back again, before, before. I mean, I was watching. I, I was like five years old <laughs> when we were in that scenario. So, and were so you watching I've the yield curve in kindergarten? Were you? <laughs> no, no, I was not looking at. So I've never experienced in my career like this scenario. So that is what is different. But again, like the reaction to it uninverting, I would not expect it to be. I mean, because. And the other thing too about un inverted yield curves as being recessionary markers, and so 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 we have a lot of people saying, "Well, looks like we've avoided the recession or we avoided the bear market um, because we've been so bullish for this past uh, uh, fifteen months or so." And it's like, well, inverted yield curves have always have actually been really bullish. Like the markets are are tradition. I mean that, and that is not different from the normal relationships. When the when the yield curve inverts during the process of inverting. The stock market generally is does really really well. Always has done really really well. It's the process of uninverting that's not you know favorable uh, for risk appetite, and, and we just have not experienced that yet. And right. and the longer we go without it, the better. Unfortunately, like once we do uninvert, then it won't be very comfortable, right? I have but, I have a question. Uh -huh. Yeah, one question quickly, just on the nomenclature. An uninversion is when it crosses back above the zero line. Yes. Mm -hmm. But when it's disinverting, that is being <laughs> inverted less so. So in yeah. other words, climbing up, is that right? Do I have that nomenclature yeah. right? Yeah, moving towards zero. Moving towards zero is not it's bad. It's the disinversion. Moving... Yeah, yeah. The uninversion is on the crossover above zero. Yeah, and traditionally, like, you know, like the 10-year yield should pay more than the two-year yield, right? Like that is a normal, healthy bond market by, by, and what traditionally has been like a hundred basis points or more, right? Yeah. And yeah. we're just nowhere. And once we get back to that point, like we will get back to that point. Well, we'll like it's not. We'll never be like. It's not like we'll never get uninverted again. We will get back to that point when who knows. But when it happens again, that is that's the part that the market doesn't like. Again, once it gets past moving towards zero, is still just fine because you're still inverted. But once you get past zero and you get to that hundred basis points or more. The last couple of times that it has been inverted and the Fed has started to cut, they haven't started to cut until um, until you were right around that 50 to 100 basis point um, positive, positive 50, 100 basis point level. Yeah. So again, nowhere near this. That's why I say I wouldn't be surprised if they don't cut in June because we're nowhere near uninverting right now. As a debtor, the incentive structure with an inverted year yield curve is also very strange. Like um, talking about refinancing my mortgage right now. And usually if you take the term down, you get a lower rate. It makes things better. Not really the case right now. It's very it's counterintuitive to think. Yeah, right. I was talking about my mortgage broker like, what? He's like, yeah, because of the inverted yield curve. I'm like, duh. Oh. Yeah. yeah. That thing you guys talk about every day. <laughs> one one uh, one relationship I would expect to stay the same in terms of twos tens uninverting would be unemployment. It's usually starting to tick steadily higher when the twos tens is uninverting. Unemployment rate is still super low. Looks yeah. great. Yeah, not an issue. Not an issue. So risk. I mean, you you look at like we talked about like the dollar is up this year, gold is, uh, commodities are up this year, yields are up this year. Twenty twenty two that hammered the market. This year, the market's not only up, but like it's up more than the average already in the first however many, you know, first three months. 
it's already up. so it's not just up it's not just like overcoming it is it is up in a historically bullish move in fact and when you look at the move that we've had since since that low point in october where things weren't really too bearish like we had a decline in august september uh into october but it wasn't like dramatic not not even close to what we saw in 2022 yet the market response off of that low point has been like you know literally a handful of times in history we've had this much this bullish of a move over such a short amount of time in fact i i tweeted out over the weekend um, that we have now just broken the record for the longest period of time without a two percent decline right yeah, so you, you can measure in so many different ways there's been a like relentless bid for risk assets off the october lows yeah, I, very I like similar 95 right very similar just remind everybody let's remind everybody where sentiment was in october yeah, we, got mean, reset. we were at washout levels in october sentiment in october in, in a lot of readings was worse than pre than than covid you know no, worse than no, no, no. than financial we're talking crisis. About last october not october 22. i know october 2023 dude washout levels last october it was reset. wild dude reset levels yeah. Well, you know, you you had you had um you had like some breadth indicators, like the number of stocks below the 50 day moving average was extremely low. Um, but like the ranges, like the average range usually expands during low points. It didn't uh, there was hardly any expansion of the ranges, at least on the S P. Um the 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 VIX obviously wasn't very high. I mean, it was like barely above 20, which is, you know, again, all these other moves that we've had similar to what we've had now, the VIX was a, like in the thirties or forties, and we were like barely mm -hmm. above 20 at that low point. So there were, I mean, the, the number of stocks, which interesting, that's one of the charts I shared with you. Um, the number of stocks right now um, uh, that are above their 200 day moving average, I don't know if you've noticed, is, is gotten above that 400 level, 80%, which you see is not very common. By uh, 2001, 2021, it was, we got pretty high and stayed up there. Uh, wow. for a good chunk of time in fact the average that 20-day average is that blue line uh, yeah. that's following uh that bar chart in the background uh, that it got really really high like extremely high like even above the 90 percent mark uh 2021 was extremely bullish market an extreme extreme bullish market but if you and look at it what, what's that it almost broke 10 10 percent to the downside in october like you were talking about yeah yeah so so but you look at now i mean look at again look all across this is i don't know how many a 10-year chart a 10-year chart here there's there's that pre-covid peak uh where we also had a pretty strong uh rally there um and then we you know obviously covid um covid was a big drop because of an economic shutdown but we were pretty extremely bullish going into that um so the environment was set up for a correction obviously nobody knew it'd be 33 percent in six weeks but the environment, the, the technical environment was set up for, for a more uncomfortable correction because of how bullish we had been. Same thing in uh, 2017, uh, going into the early part of 2018, you can see uh, a peak in the S&P on that black line, also corresponding to a peak above 400 uh, on this. And then you can see in 15 and 16, we were, um, had strong, uh, center, uh, strong um, uh, breadth uh, right before that 15, 16 correction at the end of 15, beginning of 16, when, when really there was kind of a global slowdown going on. So here we are again with the highest level of stocks above their 200 day moving average up above that 80% mark yeah. for the first time this since that October, 2022 low point. So yeah. a pretty good rally here. And this is the first time that we've been this bullish uh, on a breadth standpoint. I think this is a good illustration that, uh, this is the best breath has been this entire cycle right now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and on the 50 too, I didn't share the 50, but the 50, the 50 has also been pretty high, uh, well above the 400 mark at times uh, during the cycle, not as high this go around. Yeah. Um, but this is the first time that the 200, because this one lags, takes a lot longer uh, for it, for it to rally up. And uh, this, this is a pretty significant level. What's you, that? Like, how do you weigh the two? You're using both the 50 and the 200 uh yeah. are you weighing one more than the other is it like one is for one time frame another is for another time frame yeah 50 is a, is a lot more tactical right you when when you get some like a crossover these moving averages um yeah. you know that's a lot more tactical i i look at the number of stocks above the 50 crossing that 20-day moving average as a signal of, of either bearishness or bullishness for the 200 
This is more of like, are we exhausted? Like, what, when are we going to get to the point where we're in exhaustion? Or like, when are we going to get to the point, like uh, was mentioned when we talked about the breadth in October of 2023? As you can see here, the number of stocks got down pretty low. But, but you know, like Steve was saying, in 2022, it was a lot lower. Like, we were down below like 80 stocks above the 200 day moving average. Very, very weak breadth that, that we didn't, we, we kind of came close, but not really to replicating in 2022. So that's kind of what I use this chart for. How how exhausted are we in either direction uh, right now? Yeah, I, I I would I would expand this and look at the New York Stock Exchange uh, rather than just a, a, yes, a list of large caps in America. I would look at the New York Stock Exchange, and we're we're not anywhere near those December highs yet. So there's still room. So when you talk about just like we're at extreme levels, maybe in the S and P 500, but when you brought it out to the New York Stock Exchange, there's still plenty of room to get just back to the December highs. In, so there's in another the chart. I, what's that? In the breadth indicator, JC? In the percentage of stocks above their 200 day. Got it. Yeah. It was higher in December than it is today for the NICE. Of course, dude. Shocked to hear that. We're not going to exceed it. <laughs> there's there's another chart I share. I'm pretty with sure you. we're not going to exceed it. <laughs> you're talking about, wait, but you're talking about new highs, not percentage of stocks above the 200. No, percentage of stocks above the 200. Okay. Yeah, new highs are actually pretty strong too. Like, really, really strong. Um, on the on the NICE and and the comp, um, so I shared another chart of the Qs relative to SPY. I'm very curious. You you took the words right out of my mouth. Very curious what you're seeing here. So so the Qs. So there, there's obviously we have the Magnificent Seven, but I kind of I kind of look at there's actually 12 companies I look at, including those seven um, that include like AMD and you know, for, kind of from a chip stock standpoint, Broadcom. Uh, which you know is associated with Nvidia in terms of that AI move and uh, and other stocks. And I brought it out to the twelve, um, and they those twelve, which are the biggest stocks. And basically, what I did is I looked at what are the biggest stocks and in, in the queues that are also in the XLK, XLY, XLC. So technology sector, consumer discretionary sector, so Tesla, Amazon, and then communication services sector, uh, which obviously is Google, Meta. Netflix uh, would be in that list too. Um, so what are those 12 companies that really drive the queue? Those 12 make up 50% of the queues, uh, just over 50% of the queues. Um, so the queue and, and make up about 20 some odd percent of the S&P 500. So when you're, when you're looking at this ratio chart of the queues to the S&P, we're essentially looking at you know, the leadership uh, of the, the market cap leadership of the market leading the way high, which in a market cap weighted index should be the case. If the market's gonna go higher, um, it will generally be led higher by the bigger companies in that index. And, and as the market gets higher, they, those large cap stocks should get larger cap. That's that's a natural phenomenon. It, you know that Yes, we have a concentrated market right now, but that always happens when we have bull markets. That's the way market cap weighted indexes work. Um, but you notice it's converging. Like, so we had a big expansion of that off that 2023 low point. So the, the, the Qs really bottomed out relative to the S&P uh, there at the end of 2022. So, so not just the October low point, but the, it was in December where the Qs bottomed out. And of course, a huge expansion um, in 2023 rallied. And then again, off that uh, kind of the regional banking crisis low in March. Um, but you notice now the momentum of that rally has been gradually declining to the point where the ratio is sitting right on that light blue line that's a 200-day moving average of the ratio. Um, you notice in uh, 2021, we broke that line, um, but that was the reopening trade, right? The reopening trade where the, the queues during 2020 rallied while the economy was shut down. We get the vaccine, we get the election results, we get this reopening trade. Um, and so IWM really expanded because they got killed during COVID and, and all the, the smaller segments of the S&P that got killed during COVID, during the economic shutdown, rallied, right, on a, on a relative basis. So you actually had a break of that 200 during a market increase. But then in 2022, you had a significant break of that 200 day, obviously during a market correction. Um, and so really when you when you break that 200 day like coming down to the 200 day like we are right now obviously has not been bearish for the markets the, the markets have been really bullish this calendar year so far in 2024 but if we were to break that line which 
you know, again, we're converging, which means we're getting closer and closer. The lines are getting closer to each other. But if we were to break and start trending lower, I kind of find it hard for the broad market to stay as bullish as it has been with its leadership underperforming to that to that degree where we're where we are now trending below that long term trend line. David, it's a it's a sector rotation story, isn't it? So in, in the case of this ratio of the Nasdaq relative to the S&P 500, let's just say it rolls over from here and fails at these levels again for the third time, which would be perfectly normal. Uh, in mm -hmm. fact, it would be, I, I think, a little bit uh, uh, unusual if it didn't roll over here. Right, in right. that scenario, um, energy, basic materials, there's other stuff that could very well be working in that environment. Do I have that right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, well, in fact, in 2023, energy was up, what, 50% or something? So, I mean, even in a market correction, when the S&P is down, energy energy did very, very well in that. It's kind of interesting to see energy behaving in the last few years as like a safety trade, right? You know, sitting right there with like utilities and staples and it's like an energy. It's like, whoa, that's, you know, that's kind of interesting to see that. And, and to see uh, real estate actually behaving like XLK and XLY and XLC. And it's like, well, that's, that's not your typical uh, uh, relationship there. But yeah, there, of course, there are going to be some things that outperform and maybe even go up on an absolute basis. Um, but but in terms of like broad market leadership, if, if you know, and yes, Apple's been down, but thanks to NVIDIA, like we've been able to, to offset that. But if NVIDIA were to break down now and Apple stays in this bearish trend and Microsoft comes off as three, I mean, if, if these companies start to, um, trend lower, right? Then it's going to be really hard for energy and materials to say, okay, well, we can take this baton and keep pushing the S and P up to these, you know, historical highs. Highs now. Yeah, they, they can't because there's no. The, the Nasdaq, first of all, has uh, zero energy. The S and P is three percent energy, right? Two percent materials. In you know, in the Dow, it's even less. Like right. so, like these things, as they can, they can triple. The sector can triple. It's not going to make a dent. It's almost yeah. mathematically impossible. And then it goes back to the conversation of what is the stock market? Is the stock market one of the large cap indexes or is the stock market all over the stocks on something like the New York Stock Exchange? Yeah, it's it's a very concentrated market. And 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 it's more concentrated now than, you know, you could argue in some measures since 2000 or even, even more concentrated in 2000. Yeah, but it's concentrated but that, in terms of the weighting in a couple of indexes. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. not concentrated in terms of returns. No, oh no, no, no. Which isn't that what matters? Yeah, yeah, it, it it does. I mean, that's and that's why we're not like as bubbly as we were in two thousand, despite uh, the concentration. Right. Um, if you recall, in two thousand, uh, transports had already been getting destroyed for, yeah, for yeah. like a year and a half. You know, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was already on the way down. It was only the Nasdaq. So you're right, talking right. about how good market internals are. There is some strong breath right now, right? That, like I said, the number of stocks above the 200-day moving average are at, you know, is above 80%, which is not common for it to be that high. And there's very, very strong breadth right now. So we, we kind of have already been seeing some of that sector rotation um, where, where we haven't had such strong outperformance in XLK, XLY, XLC. Right, quite the and opposite. Yet the market has maintained bullishness. But my, my from that chart... Again, coming down to the 200-day moving average is fine, and we can still maintain a bullishness through sector rotation. But breaking that 200-day moving average, uh, I think that's a bigger drop in risk appetite uh, that that will be unable to maintain us. You know, again, 10% plus year-to-date returns for the S&P until that leadership was to turn back up again. Um, I love this, David. This is great. We could literally do this all day. We could just keep going back and forth. I think this is fantastic. Spencer Israel, get David back on here soon. Let's sure. Have this conversation. Let's get. Let's get I mean, it's just a question of how early he wants to wake up because it's early for him. So we appreciate <laughs> it. He's no up every at morning. At the market just open. He's up. <laughs> yeah, that's the that's the burden of living in the West is you got to get up early. And but fortunately, the market's uh, closed early too. Dude, yeah, where you live is beautiful. Nobody feels bad for you. You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's true thanks a lot david this is great thanks david no problem at all Bye, thanks david. for having me dude we're definitely the next chart summit in-person event skiing gotta be park city <sighs> gotta be park city because it's just so easy to get there the altitude's not as brutal as breckenridge was like when we this was before spencer israel came on board you know there were people dropping like flies like the altitude of breck was it's just not, it was not okay for some people, you know?
But I, I believe it. And it's a pain in the ass to get to. Utah is so much easier. But skiing, not the best risk reward. You know, it's kind of like like <laughs> riding, riding a scooter. You know, well, it depends on where you're skiing and what type of terrain you're on. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's for ninety nine percent of skiers, you're fine. Sometimes you, you almost, venture. Mm, you almost hurt yourself, sir. So you. I've almost know. hurt myself a lot over the years it's, because it's easy to get hurt, man. I Not do stupid. Favorite. I've done stupid shit in my in my days, um, and I I deserve to everything I got. But I'm I'm still so, here. So okay. I'll be in charge of the non skiing activities when we when we do this chart summit. I'll, I'll plan something nice, like a, like a day a day of. You don't ski at all, dude. I could, but again, I'm 35 years old. I'm not trying to hurt myself. I, I got to be out there. Key West, JC. Key West. I don't need. I don't need to ski. Also, the cold weather just doesn't work with my body. It's just not enjoyable for me to do anything. Neither does the hot weather. Yeah, but I could deal with that better. I'd rather be sweating than shivering. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. See, Jason knows. Need... Depends on where you're skiing. Yeah, exactly. If you're jumping off of the back bowls and skiing in between trees, you better have your helmet on. Stop it, Jason. Jason is an extreme sporting professional, so take his opinion. Throw it out. I need to be in a temperature. Oh, his oh, opinion I... His opinion is more valid than yours. At least he knows what he's talking about. You're just making shit up. I'm with you, Jason. I'm a risk-reward guy. Spencer's with me. All right. Spencer, I you ski. Me? I ski. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm okay. a risk reward guy that 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 won't uh buy a crypto token if it's not on Coinbase because I'm a boomer. Yeah. All, right. All right. All right. Forget you, Jason. Uh, Stock market Mike Dawson, Ravi. Love you guys. Yeah, jet skiing. We could do that. <laughs> All right. Let, let's go over some uh some headlines here. See what's going on in the news. Um AMD, Apple, Meta uh, Google all trading down this morning. Uh, the EU is launching a probe into big tech, into Apple, into Meta, into Alphabet. Um, this is just another in a continuing series of of events on the regulatory front uh, for big tech. We talked about the DOJ thing last week, so um, yeah, I, you know, take it for what it's worth. But uh, it's an ongoing thing, and if, if if this is why you're bearish big tech, then. And you should probably find some more arguments to be bearish. Um, Boeing in the news again. CEO is going to step down at the end of the year. Uh, chairman of the board also out, uh, replacing the head of their um, their aircraft, their main aircraft division as well. So just another in a con continuing series of of events at that company. This is now their, this will be their third CEO. Uh, well, they, they've had they've had two CEOs. Uh, in the last five years, this will not be their third uh, CEO in, in in that time. After uh, Dennis Calhoun steps down, uh, congratulations, I guess, to all the DWAC bag holders. You're finally getting your your SPAC merger, uh, apparently. So, so the the, the DWAC merger with Truth Social, which, is, which has been in the works for like two, maybe three years now, uh, finally appears to be going through. And, and uh, the on, reason so the chips were all down oh, this morning on. was. China has adopted some new rules. They are going to stop their use of Intel chips and AMD chips in all government computers. They're going to replace Microsoft Windows with some Chinese equivalent of Microsoft Windows. And um, hold on, you're yeah. moving too fast. You're moving too fast. Hold on, back Sorry. to the DWAC. So the DWAC was the was it uh, the Special Purpose Acquisition Corporation that was. Yes built to merge with D with uh the truth social which correct is was like a republican twitter yeah more or less yeah you can call it that yeah is it is it is that not right is that not no 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 i mean that's that's a fair characterization i would say because i saw biden trolling uh the trumpster uh this weekend because trump was bragging about how he won the uh his golf tournament like in his own club yeah and then uh the biden was making fun of him for that um yeah as a shitty golfer, like that's that's that can't be easy. I mean, unless he like really cheated, but Are so these, yeah. Mm -hmm. What? Go ahead. Sorry. No, it's just it's interesting that that deal is finally going through. So now it's essentially like, so is it a social media stock now? Like, is it part of the social ETF? <laughs> is it part of the ETF? Certainly I, not. I don't think so. <laughs> Why it, certainly not? Is it a social media stock? Uh, it officially is now, is it not? Well, it's not official. No, uh, the, it hasn't. 
the the combination hasn't happened yet. It's going to happen. The powers um, have the you know not- do you, do you know that do you know that uh, DWAC is based on Grand Avenue in Miami. So when I got my car in Miami, my parents the first thing they told me, really the only thing they said, it was when you go to Coconut Grove, don't take Grand Avenue, go around. What do you mean DWAC? Is headquartered there. Yeah, yeah that, that's the office for the special purpose company. Digital World Acquisition really? Corp is is on Grand Avenue, which I don't know where on Grand Avenue it is, but it is hood there. Surprise, it's not Palm Beach. Um, I am too. Yeah, it's, it's based in Coconut Grove. Palm Beach is blowing up. Uh, really good stuff over there. So, DWAC is not going to be put in any indexes anytime soon. No. Why? It's just not. Why? Because it's all the same bullshit. They're not going to index a Trump stock. They're not going to do it. It's its own beast. Zero. That's why. Here it is. So it's not in the hood. It's in. It's in the. It's in the Grove. It's where. It's by where we're staying when we go down to Miami in a couple weeks, or you go up to Miami. I'm going down to Miami. It's not in the hood. I go up. You go up. I go down. I only go down to Cuba. Right. And how many times have you done that? Zero. Uh, well, that's good news. So the Boeing guy is out too. That's interesting. I don't know what took so long there. Uh, I just so- don't understand why it's not being added to the social media ETFs, a billion and a half company. What What's so good in those social media ETFs that this one's not maybe, good? Maybe they'll add it. Good maybe they'll add it. I'm sure and there are gun, rules. Gun to my head, they're not adding his stock to any index anytime soon. I, I'm, um, I'm sure there are, there are rules. So for any rules-based index, if it's a market cap thing, What'd you just say? It's a billion and a half dollars. Is that you just said? Yeah, it's yep. a liquidity thing. It's a float thing too. All right, they're not gonna put it there. Um, whatever. Also, I read an article last week, Spencer. Did you see this? That he apparently, and you can't, you can't really believe much that you hear in the news about any of these guys, but apparently he solicited a sale to Elon Musk of Truth Social. And Musk didn't want it. Did yeah, I'm, I'm, sh- I mean, sure. Yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, that like, makes sense. But that makes sense, sense. yeah. <laughs> Are you with me? Elon Musk, too. You really can't believe anything anybody says about these guys anymore. And I'm not you saying can't believe anything he says about himself. You can't. <laughs> anything. Like, Eric Swisher yeah. was on Bill Maher this weekend. I, I could only, like, stomach about two and a half minutes of her. But, like, no one likes Elon Musk anymore. It's no. just funny. I like, it, I like Elon Musk. What's wrong with Elon Musk? I like him, too. I, I'm okay with I don't like him i don't not like him i think he's i think he's hilarious like if i had that much money i'd be doing funny i would be doing stupid shit to make myself laugh too i respect that yeah (laughs) he is who he is um unapologetically like Uh, like he's gonna make the doge he's gonna make a meme coin the currency of twitter like that's gonna happen and i think he should do it just because that's hilarious no by the way can we talk about how the uh speaking of pot stocks the bitcoin uh the uh having is on 420. Isn't that great? That's that's gotta mean something. It means something. Yeah. Oh, uh last headline. Congrats to all the lucid motors bag holders. You got some emergency funding from the Saudis here today. So which which stock? Lucid L C I D. Actually, there's a good article in the in the Journal over the weekend. It was a fun little article about um, how all the EV stock companies are running out of money. They're all running out of cash, right? And uh, they, they had a fun little like battery meter to say how much juice each company had left, how much cash. Yeah. Wait, where? Um, I want to see this. Can you send this to me? This sounds great. Yeah, it was fun. It was short answer. They're all running low on cash, but Lucid just got uh, a few billy from the Saudis. So let me say something about the Saudis and money. Everybody wants to talk shit about the Saudis until they get an offer. <laughs> Better off just biting your tongue because there's a lot of money sloshing around out there in Saudi Arabia and they're deploying it over here in America. And everybody's got an opinion until they get an offer. That's too good to say no to. I mean, everyone's got a price, right? So, money's money. Oh, what's, what's a few billion dollars if you're Saudi Arabia? Um, anyway. All right, that's pretty much all I had on on the news front. Um, yeah, well, what was the offer here or the deal for Lucid? It was uh, oh, it was only one billion, not even a few, just one billion. Hmm. All right. Also, anyway, uh, Dawson, well, Dawson, uh, you guys want to talk? Dawson in the chat um, pointing out the uh, the uh, Geo Bowden, uh, the meme token. Oh, to- I thought he just. I thought that was a a, a typing error. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, that is okay. that is the token. B O D E N. 
uh, currently sitting at uh, new all-time highs, market cap of two hundred and forty million. So a quarter billy for the uh, Bowden, the uh, Geo Bowden. Uh, for Crazy. those of you who uh, partake, um, that can be found on the Radium Exchange. Uh, Straza is uh, not interested. Yeah, but JC, who's buying these things? Who cares? That's so ridiculous. The names doesn't themselves. matter. You could go go on the block and chain, and you could see everybody who's been buying it. If you're really interested, they got all the wallets that own it. It's not a big That's, deal. Sure. That's, who is buying it? I, I, at least you can see like uh, wallets and accounts, which you can't see in the stock market and track right? records. So. Yeah. In real time, by the way, not this like you know forty five days later bullshit. Like, now, no, 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 now. Is it possible that all these wallets are tied to the same person? Sure, we don't know. And that's okay. you don't know that. That's okay. <laughs> you don't know. Don't know. Doesn't matter. Know. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, good good call out there, uh, Dawson. I see um, Jason's in the chat. Uh, he's he's digging the uh, the commentary there. We listen. We don't like to get too far down the cap scale, but now you're talking about a quarter billion in market cap. It's not nothing. It's almost a small cap stock. Or the equivalent thereof. Let's do a quick little morning yeah. rundown. Dow futures down 80 points this morning. A um, couple of minutes, 10 minutes into the open. S&P futures down a third of a percent. NASDAQ futures down almost a full percent this morning after getting slaughtered last week uh, to close out the week. Uh, bond futures down again here. That's interesting as interest rates creep it up. Uh, gold futures up 1%. Silver futures up two-thirds of a percent. Uh, crude oil futures up a percent and a quarter. Crude oil up to 81.60. Uh, gold hanging in there right around uh, just under 2200 uh, You got the dollar down in early trading. You got the volatility index up towards 13.4. U.S. 10-year yield 4.236 on the U.S. 10-year yield. Um, then you got uh, Bitcoin down. Uh, Bitcoin's flat. Uh, Ethereum's flat. Nothing's really going on there. I got a Bitcoin chart I want to uh, discuss here. All right. So VWAP. In crypto, it's we talk about it a lot like, should you do it? Should you not do it? Does it really make sense? These things are all traded on different exchanges. We don't have an aggregate volume uh, read from all the different exchanges, which to me is just crazy. Um, Brian Shannon says yes. Uh, and that's good enough for me. That's good. I was going to say, that's good enough for me. <laughs> I, I fully defer uh, to Brian Shannon on this one. So excited for our new podcast to come out. We just had Brian on last week. Great conversation. Throw up slide one. The VWAPs are just. They're, they're fantastic. So is it as simple as just buying the VWAP reclaim here, JC? So I've anchored a VWAP from pivot highs uh, from March. You have my answers now. Highs. And then the pivot now. highs from back in February. The current consolidation is ranging between these two VWAPs. This would be a VWAP pinch. Ding, 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 ding. Come if on we... now. Come on. Who's reading the books? Who's reading? Yeah, so this is Brian's new thing wrote about it in the new book. Um, I think that's it. What is it? 60, 68, call it, for confirmation? I think, you're, I, I think you're getting cute. I got to see a seven handle or it's not for me. The VWAP allows you to jump entries, and I'm with you. We talked about this on Chart Request Live last week, right? In a bull market, I, I think not only can you jump entries, but I think it's, it's let's use the word prudent again. I think it's prudent to do so. Um the VWAP is a tool that allows you to jump an entry before you get a horizontal resistance line breakout, right? So I think I, I'm, I'm a big fan of scaling in and scaling out. I think you could scale in, start your scaling on the VWAP break. Like JC said, you get that ultimate confirmation. I, two places, the old all-time highs around 70, but also now the new pivot highs from earlier in March, right? So that's three levels that you could scale in at um, if you're looking for Bitcoin exposure. No? Um, if I, I don't have a problem with uh, a starter position and adding on a breakout, I don't have a problem with that, but it's the okay. adding on the breakout part that I'm mostly interested in. Okay, fine, yeah, all right. You feel uh, me? Like, slower... I don't have a problem with that strategy, like, okay, you want to start legging in, you want to jump the breakout, like Straza said, I get it, but I think that the more important trade along that sequence is the, is the really doubling, tripling, quadrupling down on the breakout above 70 uh yeah um adam richard what is the lower vwap anchored to it's anchored to the february high how arbitrary do you think that is to me it's pretty arbitrary no it's the february high no 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 i get it i i, I just i don't know 
uh, I think maybe you might be giving a little more importance than I would is all. You're welcome to do so. You give more importance to women's college basketball and I don't, and we're still friends. It's okay. Again, I, w- I won't have to go into it. I anchor the way I learned from the one Brian Shannon. I'm not anchoring based on arbitrary shit. I'm anchoring the way Brian Shannon would anchor. Anchor away, my friend. But Brian it's- Shannon does not manage my portfolio. I'm a big anchor. And Brian Shannon and I do very different things. Fine. I like horizontal shit. And I like to break out. I like buy breakouts above the horizontal ones. I like you know? both. I like both. I know you do. I like both. That's what you're doing here. And I'm reiterating that I don't I don't dislike that strategy. I've heard you say way dumber things. What but all I'm saying is that the more the, and would you agree with this? The most important part of that sequence is the buying above seven. Yeah. I do agree with that. We all agree with that. I like that's the big one. I know. I'm looking so you can really juice your risk reward by jumping an entry though. If you're trading something short term. So I'm always looking for the optimal entry. Uh, and that's where this comes from. Maybe I do it too much sometimes, right? And probably have more losing trades as a result of it. But if you get a, get a really solid entry on something that you're trading just a couple weeks out, it can be really solid. Also, I want to talk about the Bitcoin miners really quick. Thinking of holding Bitcoin miners into the weekend. So I was dealing with this on Friday. And here's the conclusion that I came to. I held all my Bitcoin miner positions uh, Friday. Why? It's a primary uptrend for Bitcoin, right? So when you have two and a half, three days of closed equity markets and open crypto markets, chances are prices are going to move in the direction of the primary trend, which is higher, which means that chances are I'm going to get to my desk on Monday morning and see higher prices in the Bitcoin miners. No? Is that the right way to think about this? I have come to the point where I am I am not overthinking or I'm trying to not overthink the relationship between the miners themselves and Bitcoin itself. You just got called the Cal Ripken of markets, and that is cool for you. That is pretty cool. That's Thanks, Dawson. One. Shout out, Dawson. Yeah, we love I you. appreciate that. Cal Ripken, uh, fun fact, I grew up an Orioles fan. Uh, Because the Orioles used to do spring training down in uh, Miami Stadium, and we didn't have a professional team. And I was a shortstop. Kyle Ripken was the man. You know? My dad said I was more of a Kyle Ripken than an Ozzie Smith, because at the time, Ozzie Smith was the man, too. (laughs) Uh, I just didn't have the speed to get uh, uh, compared to Ozzie Smith uh, or the athleticism. Nothing like it. I was more of like a slow-moving guy, like a Ripken, you know? Gotcha. Certain parts of this country, JC was just compared to you a god, a literal god. <laughs> anyway, uh, hey, we have Ian. Cully. You want to talk some fake? We have Ian Cully here. Yeah, yeah come on. But Steve, to, Steve, to answer your question, sure. Or you can wake up and you're down five, five, six, seven percent. You know, it is what it is. JC could uh, never do a cartwheel ever. Are you kidding uh, me? Hey, markets trend. Yeah. Backflips in the yeah. infield. No. Trends persist. All right, let's Trends let's go, Ian. Good morning, guys. Ian Cully in the house. What's up, my man? What's happening? Did you have a good oh, weekend? You know, a little minor league hockey, a little, a little dog with hat, dog with hat up at two and a half billion market cap. Dog with hat. Where, where, where does that trade? Dog with hat on the radium. It's with, it's with hat. With hat. Dog with, with hat. With hat. I apologize. I apologize. Yeah, don't buy the wrong coin. You know, there's some scams out there. You know, you got to be careful with that. <laughs> Yeah, dog with hat. Uh, it's on. It's on Binance, actually. Okay. Uh, it's on Radium. Yep. Um. All right. So, Ian Cully, yes. You know, we had a great conversation with David Settle uh, today, where we were talking about sort of a, a new regime. We we're talking about maybe not new anymore, but a different type of regime than what we've been used to. How old are you, Ian? Uh forty three. You're older than me. We're about the same age. I'm forty two, bro. Oh, come on, we're the same age. Yeah, you're older. So uh, you look good, though. Looking good. Um, Ian, you know, this this regime that we've been in the last couple of years, you know, very different than what a lot of us are used to. One of the more interesting ones, and I'd love for you to hear your thoughts on that, is the dollar and energy, mm. you know, dollar and crude oil. Mm. You know, the way I learned it 
was, you know, dollar down, oil up, dollar up, oil, right? You know, that's right. just not the case now. What? Let's start there and, you know, broaden it out to commodities in general, you know, dollar and commodities moving together, like thoughts there? Yeah, I think that has to do with, with interest rates um, and, and the, the positive correlation uh, between the dollar and the U.S. 10-year yield. Um, and, and I don't I don't see that changing anytime soon. So as long as, you know, that's the case, then, you know, the dollar and commodities are likely going to continue to trend together. Um, you know, we was last week, uh, Switzerland came out and, and started cutting rates. Uh, I'm starting to see signs uh, of Europe at least talking about cutting rates sooner rather than later. So if if that starts to pick up steam and they, they start cutting in the coming months and the U.S. does not, I think we're going to continue to see a stronger dollar. Now, the question is, in that environment, does a stronger dollar impact equities? That's kind of where my head's at right now. I'm wondering if, if, if we get a stronger dollar mid-year into the fall, if stocks are even going to care, if that relationship, that correlation is going to uh, begin to break down. Ian, is it as simple as the U.S. dollar index, or you think we should be looking at something um, like something more specific? Euro, Mexican peso, you know, I'm just throwing a few out there. Any thoughts on that? Or you know, I, I like looking at CEW, something as simple as as as, as the, the emerging market currency ETF, just to get a broader look on what's going on. And there's, there's a slight divergence. Yeah. You know, I mean... We're going back to, to to last fall, so you know we're not we're not really getting we're not nitpicking here, um, but yeah, you know, it's it's messy, you know. Both of you know both CEW and the DXY, the U.S. dollar index, are chopping sideways, um, and I think it's going to re remain messy, um, you know, most likely for the rest of the year. And what about and, this uh, MXN? You know what? I think that's more just about um, the uh, the carry trade, and you know, and, that, and that's and that's just that that remains one of the main fundamental drivers right now for the currency markets. You know, everyone's holding on the dollar because it just it pays. Um, you know, and, that, and I look at the U.S. dollar yen. We were talking about the yen uh, last week uh, in our internal meeting. You know, I look at that big big base on the U.S. dollar JPY. I think I think that thing's gonna go, right? Um, pull but up, yeah, we'll, pull up we'll slide see. two. Pull we'll up slide see. two quick. What are you thinking there? So it's like two. Yeah, exactly. This is this. Yeah, same same thought with with the dollar yen. Yeah, I think this. I, I, you took, I was gonna say um, I got the dollar yen. I got the dollar yen coming up now here. Right. I think I think it goes. I think it goes. Yeah. Here's the dollar yen. And we and we like to look at this chart. We look like to look at the the dollar Mexican peso overlaid with with the VIX. Yeah. Because you know where 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 the pesos uh, been training the VIX is kind of following. So, um, you know we're seeing that bond market volatility. You know ease. You know stocks continue to press up and imprint new all time highs at least at the index level. Um. So yeah, it's back and forth a couple of times there, Spencer, on the dollar yen and uh, and uh, Mexican peso there. You know, there's there's a lot going on here, right? Mm -hmm. Where's Spencer? Spencer, go back and forth a couple of times there, so you can see the kind of the. Uh, there you go. Right. I yeah, mean, and I think it's I think it's funny. Yeah. This news came out it was either last week or you know over the weekend, um, where you know uh, officials in Japan are. Are claiming that the fundamentals, you know, don't support the price action in the yen, the yen weakness. I just that just you know for me is like fuel. You know, I just I can just see this thing ripping and the yen continue to crumble uh, against headlines like that. Um, is this breakout for real in gold? Can we trust it for the first time? Like I don't know ever. I don't see. I don't see why not. At the same time. At the same time, you know, silver really hasn't uh, begun to participate. We're not seeing silver outperform gold. We're not seeing the miners really kick into gear yet. And and here's the problem with that. Throw up my materials chart. 
gold, not only are there better opportunities than buying spot gold and gold miners in the broader market, but mm -hmm. even within the materials sector, gold, despite starting to work, is not working nearly as well as a lot of the other stocks there. Mm -hmm. This is large cap materials, new all-time highs. How many gold miners are at new all-time highs? Uh, zero. Uh, zero. Any? Yeah. Zero. <laughs> zero. Zero point zero, Spencer. Yeah. Give it to him. And yeah. you can look at chemicals, you could steal. <laughs> Copper's waking up. All yeah. of these subgroups, I would, I would, I would own like I would rather own so much more than gold miners or god silver miners. Look at chemicals. Chemicals and are great. What, and what would it take, Straza, for you to start doing the opposite? Gold miners start trending higher. That's that's very valid. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm not gonna argue with that. There, you're in a range. I, Everything else is breaking out of a range. I want to buy the things that are breaking out of a range, indicating a new leg higher is underway. Maybe that happens for gold in the future, and I want to buy those stocks then. But anytime I dig into materials, it's the chemicals, it's the copper, it's the steel, right? Those are the names that are popping up um, with with the best charts. Yeah, it's kind of like Bitcoin and Bitcoin miners, right? Big, you know, miners, yeah. you know, are, are yeah, still right. underperforming Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, so, so, so uh, what are you saying? Just buy spot gold. Like that's the move right now in precious metals. Just buy. Gold. Yeah, GLD. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like buy the ETF. Buy physical ETF. Yeah. I think. What do that's you think about? Move. What do you think about this streak for materials though? Large cap materials. Throw up the consecutive. Yeah. Consecutive. Yeah. Is, I mean, is. Are we looking at you know stopping or starting uh, uh, thrust here? Right. Great um, point. Go back. Look at the pre financial crisis thrusts or pre and post. Right. Yeah. Which one right. is it? Right, exactly. Right, because you don't want to be buying the first thrust on this chart. <laughs> you definitely want to buy the second one. And the thing is, we tend to get um, extreme momentum readings, both as a signal of initiation and exhaustion. And that's the toughest part about this kind of data. Which one is it? I would think, just when you think of the broader cycle, uh, a lot of reversal patterns just now completing, I would err on the side of initiation. Yeah, I agree. You know, just plus, you know, looking at the past, you know, couple years of consolidation, you know, this thing's probably just getting started. I mean, SCCO, our copper play. I mean, it's only you know, buck and a half, two bucks away from our our initial target. Happens fast. It's pretty huh? new all time, yeah. And then, and are, then these things are so little, they're gonna move. And you're seeing steel dynamics look the same. Mm -hmm. New core start to look a lot more the same. Reliance steel looking the same. All these are big boys. Freeport Macaron, we're going to be talking about Freeport Macaron at new, at new high soon. Uh, mm -hmm. It's right at the upper bounds of a smaller range within its larger range. So I'm excited for materials. When's the last time you said that? Never. You know me. Never. <laughs> Never. All the time. Like it's been so long. I'm very excited for materials. Commodity right. stocks more broadly. Yeah. I, I, I'm excited for recess. Can we do that real quick? Yeah. Me too. All right. Yeah. And hey, don't look now, but XLE is is gunning at the upper bounds of this range. It's going for it right here this week. You think it gets it done, Ian? I do. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my recess. Uh, every every so often, you consume a piece of media that really has a profound effect on you. It could be oh. a movie, a book, a podcast, a play, whatever. Uh, I had such an experience with this weekend. I watched a movie that I was totally unfamiliar with called Marcel the Shell with Shoes On. Um, That's I had never animated. seen what the animated one. Yes. Okay. I had never seen Marcel the Shell shorts on YouTube. They went viral like a decade ago. I had I didn't know what that yeah. was. Never heard of it before. Yeah. I saw this movie, and honestly, this is my favorite movie that I've seen in a very long time. Um, I laughed. I almost cried. It was. I had a profound experience watching it. I'm completely serious. Um, this is a movie with 98% on Rotten Tomatoes, so people agree with me. Um, and I just want to say it was unbelievably good. Where do if I you watch? are ever in a, if you're feeling down, if you are like depressed or unhappy or anything, put this movie on. It will make you feel better. I promise. And What's the name of the I'm, movie again? Yeah. Marcel the Shell with Shoes On. So where this do I watch it? Netflix? Netflix. It's on Netflix. Oh. It's a movie it's or is it like a cartoon? Is it like a cartoon? It's a stop motion. Yeah. It's it's um 
it, it was a viral video like t- 10 years ago and they turned it into a movie and honestly uh yeah i'll type it i'll type it out uh, in the chat it's Martin. when they yeah. turn it into a meme token call me i'm in <laughs> probably already honestly is. this movie had had a very profound effect on me i'm completely serious um with shoes on there it is there it is in the chat marcel the shell with shoes on um i'll probably watch it again in the next i don't know a couple weeks um at some point it was it just it affected me very deeply and i just cannot recommend this movie enough to everyone um, you're making me emotional sounds nice <laughs> uh, I, I, it's like it, it, it it's a kids movie but it's also for adults right I, um i'll cry it's about a show. i'll cry the disney what? movie Sure. No, it's not Disney. It's totally independent. There's yeah, like see, four people yeah. in this movie. Yeah, yeah. I'm into it. Oh, you're going to talk about basketball, but anyway. No, <laughs> no, no. No, forget basketball. Forget it. Marcel, the shell. All That's right. all I have to say. What do you guys got? I just want to reiterate the, the minor league hockey situation, especially with kids. I don't think there's any need to go to an NHL game. Mm-hmm. I could. It's further, right? But I could. Honestly, I don't know how long I'm going to wait to take my kids to an actual NHL game. I would say probably a long time because the minor league hockey is so good. So good. There's more scoring. There's more fights. There's more mascots. <laughs> say it. Yeah. Hockey is the best sporting event to go to live, hands down. Yeah, yeah, it is. We have a we have a minor league team. I don't know. Here. Sumo yeah. wrestling is pretty awesome, man. What kind of wrestling? Sumo. No. Sumo. Oh yeah, well, <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Um, grouper. I'm really in, into grouper lately. So it's the best fish, especially if you're a flaky white fish person. Um, bigger flakes than, than something like a yellowtail, really any snapper. And it's it's got that buttery texture to it. So it's really just a beautiful fish. I always was, was a big fan of black grouper, but we've been venturing out a little bit because we have all different sorts of grouper here uh, that's caught locally. Yellow edge grouper and scamp mm. grouper. If you could ever get your hands on these, some of the best fish I've ever had in my life. Uh, it's so, 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 so good. So we're on a big, big grouper thing lately, yeah. a couple times a week, really. You eat any catfish ever? I don't eat catfish. We've, we've been over this. I don't eat bottom, <laughs> bottom feeders. I don't catch falling knives. Yeah. I don't eat bottom what feeders. We, what do you think you, what do you eat lobster? What, what do you think you're doing? What do you think I, you're doing with your lobsters? No, I, not a big fan of lobster. I live the life of a trend follower. So by definition, I don't, I don't, Eat things that dwell on the bottom of the ocean. Um, last time we had sea urchin together, you were smiling from ear to ear, buddy. Oh, that's a good one. Did Did you see the picture? My brother's in Mexico right now, like harvesting sea urchins from the sea, and then they're eating them. He's got like a whole bag of sea urchins, eating them fresh. That's crazy. My mind was blown. Uh, they made like sea urchin pasta, which apparently is a thing. Listen, yeah. Uh, my advice to you, Straza, do not eat sea urchin from Mexico. Um, <laughs> Uh, he yeah. said it was good. He said it was fantastic. So yeah. get the get the ones from Hokkaido. They're, yeah. they're eating, <laughs> about bottom feeders. They're eating much better in Hokkaido than they are in Mexico. Fine. And I got one more. I know we're running over here. Frontier Markets. If you want to throw up the chart really quick, this is a big one, guys. The riskiest stocks. Guys, the highest risk. The most riskiest stocks. stocks. The highest risk. Most often. What is that? Are making new uh, new highs. Probably twenty month fresh highs. Highest level since 2022. This is very bullish. Speaks to risk appetite. I'm done. Hey, EMXC is breaking out too, right? 52 yep, guys. Just, yep. That's right. Same thing. Yep. Not cool. bad. All right. We got to get to work. I got to go. <laughs> yeah. All right. That, that's it. Uh, thanks to Ian Cully for hanging out. Thanks to David Settle. We have the Flow Show with Straza and Sean coming up at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time right here on Stock Market TV. Thank you, everyone in the chat, for hanging out. Hit the like, go make some money, and uh, we'll see you guys later. All right? Have a good one. You gonna hit the button? You gotta press the button. I'm trying. I know. I don't I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Goodbye everyone. I don't know what's going on. I can't take no loss. I don't need nobody cost. I hit the ground and it go off. Yeah.